When you think about fungi, you think about mushrooms. And beyond the dinner plate or the supermarket, you'll often see the odd mushroom on a woodland walk. It will be there today and gone tomorrow. A fleeting sight. And that's because the mushroom is simply an asexual fruiting body. It's full of spores. Spores that want to fly out into the air, find new ground and germinate to form a new fungus. When you reach for a slice of bread to make a sandwich and find this, or when you dig deep into the fridge to find an onion and find this, what you're really seeing are varieties of fungi that could look like this. Microscopically, they can be seen to be long, thin threads. The threads are called hyphae and together it makes up a mycelium. So the mushroom that you see is just the fruiting body of that and the rest of the fungus will still be there, possibly underground. Here we see some asexual fruiting bodies that are throwing their spores out into the air. However, fungi are really clever because they can reproduce sexually as well as asexually. So why would a fungus want to reproduce sexually? Well, if conditions are bad, by reproducing sexually, there is a chance of variation. The variation in the offspring may suit the new environment better and therefore natural selection, survival of the species. So quite simply, what happens is this. Hyphae from two different fungi join together. They then have an, a zygote and it has double the number of chromosomes. So what it has to do is undergo meiosis, cell division, and then it produces spores. The spores have a single set of chromosomes and they're released into the air. In plants, of course, we know that the male sex cell is contained in the pollen and the female parts are in the ovule. And during sexual reproduction in plants, when the pollen lands on the sticky stigma, it then grows a tube down all the way to the ovule and the male gamete is passed down that tube and fertilises the egg in the ovule. Of course, many plants can also reproduce asexually by growing runners or in the division of bulbs, such as daffodils, for example. Here's a bulb you may have seen before reproducing asexually. And then we have some organisms that use both meiosis and mitosis, i.e. sexual and asexual reproduction, as part of their life cycle. Remembering, of course, that although mosquitoes spread malaria, it's actually the parasite that they carry that gives you malaria. And it all starts in the liver and red blood cells. This is where they start to reproduce asexually. Remembering, of course, it's only the female mosquito that bites. She needs the blood because she needs to produce eggs. So the parasite in your red blood cells, once the mosquito has sucked out the blood, it notices the drop in temperature. The drop in temperature is then the trigger. And very quickly, a sexual form of the parasite is formed. Sexual form then bursts out of the red blood cells to meet other sexual forms and then form a zygote. But the zygote then has two sets of chromosomes. So the zygote then undergoes meiosis to produce new asexual parasites that will go and infect another human host. This way, the parasite has developed variation. So malarial parasites reproduce sexually in mosquitoes and asexually in their human host. This variety in their life cycle also makes them very difficult to treat. Okay, so how well do you know this topic? Can you answer these questions? Pause the video and take a look. Natural selection is a process which, which relies on which type of reproduction? What are the advantages of asexual reproduction? When might an organism decide to switch from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction? What is the benefit of using both asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction as part of your life cycle? And can you give an example of asexual reproduction in plants? 